the Google Pixel 9 is here, and a lot of people are going to be talking about new features like the design as well as the display, battery life. But what really makes this phone stand out is the Tensor G4 chip and all the AI experiences that it enables on this new wave of devices. And to help us walk us through some of those scenarios and how it can actually help you know, your life get a little bit better is uh, Jesse Seed, who is on the team that is behind the Google Silicon, as well as Zach Gleischer, who is at DeepMind, and they have a deep collaboration with the Tensor G4 team. So Jesse, what do you think makes the Tensor G4 chip stand out in a, a sea of smartphones? I think the biggest innovation that we made this year was being the first silicon, the first phone to run Gemini Nano with multimodality. Mm -hmm. And that unlocks some very cool use cases, one of which is pixel screenshots. Uh, so that's very handy if you're trying to remember, remember things. Um, I'm sure you got a chance to play with that. Yep. And another feature, not related to the Gemini Nano model, but I really love is also the Add Me feature. And so those of us that are the photographers of our, our family or our crew definitely appreciate being able to go back in and, and you know, dynamically add the photographer in. And that's something that we, um, we worked a lot on to tune over 15 different machine learning models and also using the Google Augmented Reality SDK. So yeah, I think those are my top two favorite uh, tensor enabled pixel experiences this year. So how do you get something like Gemini Nano to fit on something that's as compact as a phone? At DeepMind, we, we collaborate with a whole bunch of teams across Google, and we want to make sure that we're building Gemini models that meet the needs of all Google products. Um, so as we were developing Gemini uh, in collaboration um, with uh, Android and Pixel, of course, um, we realized that there was this need for on-device models. Um, so we, we saw this as like a, a challenge because, you know, on the server, everyone was keeping to push, like everyone was pushing for more capable models that were potentially bigger. And we, on the other hand, had all these interesting constraints that weren't present before on memory constraints, power consumption constraints. Um, so in partnership with the Tensor team and Pixel, um, we were able to come together and understand what what are the core use cases um, for these on-device models? What are the constraints for these on-device models? And actually um, co-develop a model together, which was uh, a really exciting experience um, and made it possible to build something that was so capable and able to power these use cases. For someone who hasn't upgraded their phone in let's say like three or four years, what do you think is gonna stand out for them when it comes to the Tensor G4 chip? Improving the fun, what we call fundamentals, like power and performance, are, are, are very important for us. Um, so the Tensor G4, which is our fourth generation chip, is our most um, most efficient and our most performant. And so we believe that users will see that in everyday experiences like uh, web performance, like web browsing, as well as app launch, and just overall snappiness of the user interface. So definitely think they'll be able to experience that um, in hand. And what about gaming performance? Because we know that's really important these days for people who are buying a new phone. In our testing, we actually have seen um, improved both peak and sustained performance in, in gaming and in common games that run on the platform, so yeah. So I feel like we're almost past the phase where people like are no longer afraid of AI and they're more interested in terms of how it's gonna help them. So what are some of the features within Gemini Nano coming to the phone that you're most excited about? Some of the main motivations that we see for um, the Tensor team and Pixel team coming to us for on-device use cases is, one is better reliability. Um, so the fact that you don't have to rely on an internet connection, uh, the experience can be reliable and work no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. um, another is as we think about like potentially privacy, if you don't, if developers don't want the data to actually leave the device and be fully processed on-device, um, that's possible with having an on-device LLM. I think that you know some of the features that I'm excited about is I think like the pixel screenshots is a really great one. I think that really showcases uh, showcases how we are able to get these multimodal uh, features that are working on the device. It can work it, as you can see in the demos. It was really snappy, low latency, going to be reliable and how it works. Um, but it's also a super capable model. Um, and then all this information is uh, data stored locally on your device, can be processed locally. Um, so we're really excited that it can enable experiences like that. I think we're seeing traction for summarization use cases and smart reply and some of these common themes that are happening. And those are, those are some of the use cases that we're really trying to make sure that the model works especially well for. 
Um, so I think like the models are continuing to get better, more capable, and we're gonna just see the, the possibilities of what's possible on device continuing to expand. So now that the G4 chip is in all of these phones, how do you balance like the higher performance versus thermals and battery life? So something like thermal performance and indeed even battery life, they're full system design challenges, right? It's not just about any one component, like only the chip or only something else. It's about the entire system. So what we're so lucky to have is, you know, control the full stack, everything from the silicon all the way up to the, the higher level user application and everything in between. So that means that we can tweak and refine year over year. And so, yes, as you mentioned, the addition of the vapor chamber, that's one concrete thing that we did in the pro line this year to really give a little bit of extra headroom in those, in those high sustained uh, use cases where you, you know, you're burning more power. Um, but yeah, that's the way we think about it. It's really like a full system, the full system design and how do we improve that year over year. Okay. I think to a certain degree, sometimes like users get intimidated with AI on phones, especially since we're still at the early stages. So how do you make sure with the, t the Pixel 9 in particular that people are excited and that they actually find these features to begin with? So I'm, I'm sure you've used a, a Pixel phone through a, all this process. There's this very cool thing called Pixel Tips, which I love to use when I get my my new Pixel, and will actually guide you through some of the new uh, the new like um, applications or new use cases or new ways that a particular app will work. Right. So I think that's one way that we can help communicate to users what's what's the new cool stuff to play with on your on your new Pixel phone. I think we saw with Microsoft and Recall, which they had a recall themselves, that people are a little bit nervous about like their phones knowing everything about them. But I think screenshots is a little bit different if you guys can go into that, because I know it's like more manual. You're deciding what you want your phone to capture, but at the same time, it, it can still not know a lot about you. So how do you make sure that that information stays private and only on the phone? So, I mean, one of the ways we do it is indeed by having a capable on-device model, mm -hmm. right? So that means that the analysis that's being done on that screenshot, none of it leaves the device. So that's one way that we're able to address that privacy concern. I think the other thing is just making, is like empowering users to decide what they want to do, like how they want to use something like Gemini, right? And what use cases they, they feel comfortable interacting with and what, what they don't. So I think it really comes down to, to user choice. But in the case of Pixel, Pixel screenshots in particular, uh, that is a fully on device use case. So right. yeah. So I don't think third-party benchmarks are, are going away because we're going to use them to test the you know these phones and the Tensor G4 chip. But at the same time, I think we have to start thinking about performance a little bit differently now that the AI era is here. So from your perspective, how should we be thinking about performance now when it comes to this chip? That's a great question. I think it really all comes down to real real world use cases, right? Like how does this thing actually perform in hand with the thing the, the way you're actually going to run it? So I do think that things like how fast the web browsing response is, how fast apps are launching, the quickness and the responsiveness of the user interface. Those are all sort of for everyday use cases. Those are good standard things to look at, right? Um, and then also things like how fast can you capture a picture? These are, these are all reasonable things that people really do through the course of the day. And I think those are much more representative, just a few, a few to mention, those are much more representative than, you know, the sort of, you know, often, oftentimes semi-synthetic benchmarks that we see out there um, in, in the industry. Yeah, so when it comes to the Gemini Nano model on Pixel phones, from your perspective, when does that phone pass the test in terms of performance? As we think about benchmarks for um, LLMs and Gemini, um, and especially as we think about Gemini Nano, we've seen like an in industry, a large focus on academic benchmarks. Mm -hmm. And academic benchmarks like MMLU are you know, great as it gives a, a common metric, but it could be gamified and people can optimize for them and it might not capture um, what you really care about. So for example, MMLU is a, po a popular academic benchmark um, that is gonna ask like not uh, some of the, it, it's a very diverse set of questions that it asks the LLM to answer, but maybe some of the questions that it asks is uh, just uh, uh, in information about like history, history questions. Right. For an on-device model, we don't really care that it knows it can answer history questions. We think like that's probably a better use case for a server-side model. When we care about like use cases like summarization, where it's not important whether you know um, when Rome fell <laughs> uh, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is we work closely with the partner teams um, that are building these on-device experiences. And we really try to 
gather benchmarks that they care about and the use cases that they care about so that we can evaluate against those. And that's how we think about quality. But again, this is where, what also becomes super important as we think about Gemini Nano versus our server-side flash models and Pro is we also have to think about constraints like battery consumption. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to make sure, so we work uh, that like the water, uh, the model performs well and doesn't consume too much battery mm -hmm. and that also the latency is, is good. So we actually partner with the Tensor team to profile our models as we're yeah, co-designing these models together to make sure that we are getting an architecture that works well and meets their efficiency, power consumption constraints, and then we collect data for the use cases that they care about and make sure that we can hill climb on those use cases and make the model as good as possible. Yes, MMLU and other metrics like that are great for us just to make sure that we have automated metrics that we could hill climb against because can, uh, creating good evals is often a very difficult yeah. task, Right. Um, but we do a lot of that uh, co-development together. That's great. And I would also just add, I think it's actually onto something here. It's also something to be said for, it's not just about traditional maybe metrics of performance, but also quality. So if you look at things like the quality of responses coming out of the model, or even things like quality of the photo, right? Those are more like, that's what real world users in hand are gonna care more about than right. you know some, some number on the side of a box. Yeah, it's more subjective. That's true. And, yeah. what, and as we think about quality, it's, it, we, we have, you know, sometimes we have human raters who are evaluating quality. But uh, what's, I think, really exciting about um, the development of Gemini is we could actually use larger Gemini models to what we call like auto raters to evaluate the quality of <laughs> AI rating. AI. Yes, exactly. so self rating. That, that, could be a, that can be a very powerful way for us to iterate more quickly and make sure that we are getting the model to perform well. Of course, these have their mistakes and issues as well, and that's why doing actual sanity checks with uh, human raters can be helpful too. All right, so I just wanted to say thank you to you both in terms of taking the time out to talk about this new chip and what's happening with DeepMind behind the scenes and how this is all coming to life. We're gonna test out these phones to see how good they are, but now we know a little bit more about how much smarter these things are getting.